Are we going? Wait a second. I hit the wrong button. Hang on. Okay, nope, that's not it. Hang on. Here we go. No, okay. That sounds better. Does it? No, that's not me. Is that me? No. Hi. Hi. There we go. Sorry about that. Welcome to the Mop Up for January 31st, 2023. This is episode 1412. That means it's season 14, and it's the 12th episode of our 14th season. We've been doing this show for 14 years. And if you could do me a favor, please pay attention to how we number these shows. It will make it easier for me to drop new episodes in the middle of the week, which is where I think we're heading going into this new year. So this is what's set in stone in terms of scheduling the podcast. And I want to be clear here so there's no confusion. There is a new episode of this podcast every Tuesday morning at 3 a.m. and every Friday morning at 3 a.m. That is Eastern. Did you hear what I said? Yes, David, you said there's a new episode of this podcast every Tuesday morning at 3 a.m. You didn't need to shout. You didn't need to be so condescending. Everybody who listens already knows this, but you do a new podcast every Tuesday morning at 3 a.m. and then another new podcast Friday morning at 3 a.m. Eastern. Sheesh, I mean, what, what's, what's the bug up your derriere? I, I just want people to know because that's never going to change. Okay, fine. But you could dial back the rage, sister, mister, or mister, sister. Okay, that's never going to change. But you, you might have noticed some bonus episodes coming into your feed during the middle of the week. And you might think that is the Tuesday or the Friday drop. It isn't. It's a bonus episode. A bonus episode. Aren't we lucky? There will be another episode tomorrow, for example. Oh, be still my heart. I had a scheduling problem. Boo-hoo-hoo. And so there's going to be a brand new episode within the next 24 hours. I'll set my clock. I can't wait. And that will be labeled 1413, season 14. We get it, episode 13. It will be season 14, episode 13. We can count. We understand arithmetic. This is 1412, and the episode after that would be 1413. Anyway, my newsletter comes out every Friday at 6 p.m. Please go to my website and sign up for it. Why should I do that? Well, it's good. I have a I have a good newsletter that I think you would find enjoyable. If I could read, why would I listen to a podcast? Good point. Good point. I make myself available to all my listeners every Friday night for office hours. And because of our friends overseas, we are now starting office hours at 6 p.m. Eastern. It used to start at 8 p.m. Eastern, but we're now starting two hours earlier. Let me write all this information down so I can make sure to miss it. Right. So I host from 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And then the community takes over. And then I'm back at 8 p.m. Eastern for about 90 minutes. So if... If you want to have a good time, show up at 6.30, leave at 8, and then come back around 9.30 and Feldman's gone. Yeah, I guess so. It, that's, you know, unless you want to talk to me. Oh, yes. I just, I can't wait to talk to you. I make myself available. It's a somewhat large Zoom room with people going in and out. But office hours is kind of like my podcast, but with my listeners as my guests, think of it as a, a call-in radio show. I think of it as awake. Not as in, I'm wide awake, but as in, hey, who's that stiff in the coffin? Not, not nice, not nice. Anyway, you don't, uh, you don't even need Zoom. You can dial in, and uh, you don't need to turn your camera on. Maybe you should consider turning your camera off, Feldman, and your microphone. 
Some people, as I said, don't use Zoom. They just phone in. You don't need Zoom to participate. When you get the link, it gives you some dial-in information, and we can talk about whatever you want. Why don't we talk about getting a new host of this show? And then the community takes over with lectures, PowerPoints. We watch documentaries together and then discuss them after. It's a remarkable group of people. Except for you. And you can participate as much or as little as you want. Most people lurk. They keep their camera and microphone off and just listen. Please come. Okay, today's show. Finally, when are we going to get to the show? Who's on today's show? Funny you should ask. It's the professors and Marianne. Ooh, I love them. Featuring Professor Marianne Cummings. She's a, a, a particle physicist from over at the Fermi Lab, right? And Parks Commissioner for Aurora, Illinois. Did you know that Aurora, Illinois, is the second largest city in Illinois? Yes, I, I did know that. And do you know what the first largest, the number one largest city in Illinois is? Uranus. It's Chicago. Then Professor Ann Lee uh, is also with us. She writes for the Daily Coast. Her handle is Annie Lee. Professor Jonathan Bick teaches the Twilight Zone and Star Trek at office hours. And Professor Adnan Hussein is chairman of the religion department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He also hosts the Mudgeless podcast and Guerrilla History. All of them are part of the professors and Marianne. How do you get these people to come on your show? Do you have, like, pictures of them with doing things to a donkey? No, they, they like me. No, you have pictures of them doing something with a donkey. Nobody likes you. Joe in Norway is our chef, and you can't see him. We do that for the Zoom room and our YouTube viewers. Why don't uh, you do the same with your face? Why don't, why don't we not see you? Can we do that? Anyway, uh, Joe in Norway, you can't see him uh, cooking, but it's tantalizing. It's because you have to imagine what his dishes look like. I wish I could imagine what you look like, Feldman. I think it would be uh, less stomach churning. This episode of The Professors and Marianne was recorded on January 19th. Well, why are you playing it now? It's, it's January 31st. What happened? Well, we had one of those thunderstorms. Uh, it's the worst thunderstorm I, I've ever witnessed here in Manhattan. Oh, that's sad. That's too bad that you weren't hit by a bolt of lightning. Well, my building got hit and there was a power surge that shorted out my mixer. And... Uh, I had to jump off in the middle of the the conversation. So that's when it gets really good, folks. And we switched the recording to the cloud. And then I had to retrieve the recording from my mixer and the cloud and piece it all together. So it's more than a week old, but definitely worth listening to. Especially the parts where you're not on. Those are the best. It's always great when... When I don't have to hear you. The lightning strikes at about 38 minutes into the conversation. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll tune in for that. That's, that's how boring you are, Feldman. The most exciting parts of your show is weather. Have you thought about, like, just ending, not your career, just everything? All right. You've, you've crossed the line. Anyway, uh, please enjoy The Professors and Marianne. And I'll be back in about 24 hours with a brand new episode. Thank you. No, thank you. Seriously. You're fantastic. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. Time for The Professors and Marianne. Professor Marianne Cummings is a particle physicist with the Fermi Lab, as well as Parks Commissioner, Aurora, Illinois. Professor Ann Lee writes over at the Daily Cows under the handle Annie Lee. Read her every day. Professor Adnan Hussein, Chairman of the Religion Department, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. 
co-host of Gorilla History, as well as the Mudgeless podcast. We'll ask you who is going to be on those wonderful shows shortly, and then we'll talk about your class on the Crusades every Saturday at 930, and we'll tell people how they can attend that for free. Very generous of you. Professor Jonathan Bick teaches The Twilight Zone every Friday night at office hours and every Saturday afternoon at office hours. He teaches Star Trek and Joe in Norway is not only responsible for the scheduling of office hours, he is a world class chef. What are you going to be torturing us with today? Hey, David. Yeah, I'll be making a traditional Korean dish called Tiokpaki, which is actually a fresh rice noodle in tubes, tube form, about like the pinky size, except I'm going to be cheating. A very untraditional method. If you've got uh, rice paper lying around that you don't know what to do with, you can actually make quick rice noodles that resemble uh, traditional tiokpaki. So I'll be rolling some noodles with the rice paper, and then I'll make two different banchan side dishes, uh, uh, pickled uh, mung bean, and I'll do something with this beautiful baby asparagus. Um, and, they are cute. The, uh, the noodles. They are cute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we've, we've got salmon john, which is a, a traditional kind of type of miso fermented soybean paste that's a signature taste in there and some korean chili okay get to work Lou. this is torture let's first talk about lucinda uh, her and how, she's the prime minister of new zealand she says she's not coming back she's not running for re-election professor adnan hussein your thoughts on the announcement? Uh, well, uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, of course, became a globally renowned figure for two main things in New Zealand that pushed uh, the small country of New Zealand into great prominence in world news. One was, of course, the horrific uh, shooting at a mosque in Christchurch and her immediate condemnation of the shooter as a terrorist and her empathetic um, uh, engagement with the you know Muslim community at Christ Church in comforting them, and also for her immediate um, action in putting forward uh, gun laws that restricted um, and managed to get it as a bipartisan bill uh, through their legislature right away. So that was a very effective response that really put her um, in front of the world. And then secondly, really, she was lauded uh, by many uh, for a successful COVID policy during the pandemic that um, managed to keep New Zealand for quite a long period of time relatively COVID-free, apart from a few fairly localized um, uh, outbreaks. and kept the overall death rate, uh, illness and serious illness and death rate quite low. And so she was someone who was um, very serious about the need for public health restrictions and communicated very clearly about this with a sense of communicating the importance of empathy. So again, we could say that in both of the two moments that have distinguished her career and renown as a world leader, is expressing and showing empathy in a way that seemed authentic and wasn't um, the typical kind of, uh, you know, political uh, blabber, but seemed genuine and effective. And she came into the position of heading the Labour Party of New Zealand in a rather sort of shock situation where she was elected just a few weeks before an upcoming election. Um, that everyone expected the opposition figure, um, you know, the the other party leader to win decisively, uh, which is partly why they, you know, the Labour Party may have taken a risk in getting somebody who wasn't a conventional politician, 
was uh, a woman, unlike the four male, uh, you know, competitors for the position. And as it happens, she managed to win a close victory, but nonetheless, a victory that shocked everyone in New Zealand. And she subsequently won another election on the coattails of her successful COVID policy in 20, I forget exactly when it was, but it was soon after, uh, you know, the pandemic in the first or second year of the pandemic. Uh, But subsequent to that, she has faced a lot of pushback from right-wing forces that, if you recall, a year ago had a a major protest on uh, the lawn of parliament that turned uh, violent and where many in this participating in this um, uh, kind of riotous uh, situation called for the death, the execution of the prime minister. Um, And this was basically a protest against the measures, the lockdown and restrictions and anti-vax basically was an anti-vax kind of mobilization. Um, And um, so there has been a kind of ugly period growing over the last two, three years of um, negative uh, uh, reviews of, of some of her previous successes and policies, but also um, kind of mobilizing um, anger at the gun law restrictions and the COVID you know, measures. Um, and this has been combined also with, you know, the downturn economically. So, um, you know, rising interest rates, higher inflation, because everybody feels that the best response to rising inflation is to ri- raise interest rates for some reason. And if you listen to Professor Richard Wolf, who has been inveighing against this on every possible platform he can, there are many other tools in the toolbox to deal with rising inflation that don't punish the poor and working class to the same extent that rising interest rates do. So you have this kind of populist right wing cultural uh, sort of uh, movement that has started to gel that is fueled further by the fact that over the last couple of years, there has been much more economic distress among people in New Zealand. And so she hasn't been able to push through uh, some of the more ambitious um Uh, policies and programs um, that she had intended. There have been a few victories of raising the, um, I believe, the uh, minimum wage by about 30 percent. There are a couple of other kind of smaller scale but important uh, workers' rights and opportunities, you know, to negotiate and make sure you have sick leave. And, you know, there are various uh, rights that have come to working people um, and they have had lower uh, uh, unemployment. So there are some economic successes for the working class, but some of the bigger kinds of policies um, have been stymied. And of course, she has not been able, despite a lot of rhetoric and support for it, to do anything about their emissions on climate change. So anything that would have cost really a large amount of money in government spending has essentially been ruled out because she has ruled out, you know, a wealth tax or, you know, various kinds of taxes that could raise that sort of revenue for a big universal kind of program. And so while she is a social Democrat in most people's perspectives, I think she still has bought into the logic of neoliberal governance to some extent that has limited the potential to really transform uh, New Zealand's uh, political scene. And as a result, she seemed heading into the next election uh, uh, scheduled for October to be in a genuine big fight uh, that you know, was unclear. She's popular personally, but um, there's unhappiness with some of the direction. And this would have been a really tough election. And she has now, by resigning, maybe she thinks she is giving the uh, Labour Party uh, opportunity to choose uh, another leader, but they're going to be under the circumstances where they're not going to be able to pick somebody who's a little unorthodox or um, off the beaten path like her. But now, because um, 
uh, you've got six, seven, eight months before the election. You can't have a shock kind of like a move They're They're going to actually have to campaign for a really seriously long period of time. And they're going to have to, you know, basically be established politicians from the Labour Party. And so there's really a sense perhaps of uh, crisis here. Um, but others are saying that um, she's been chased out of this because it was a grueling kind of experience and that the threats that have mounted over the last couple of years um, have kind of chased her out, the personal threats, the attacks on her, her family, and so on. And so as she put it when she made her statement, she knows what the job takes in terms of energy and commitment, and she just didn't feel she had anything left in the tank. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how people reflect on this. I mean, it seems to me that she was a great rhetorical leader and did some good things, a lot like, say, in Obama, in terms of being able to inspire people to express uh, empathy. But when it comes to some of the big transformative things that you have to do in order to change the situation and put in these social programs that are popular, there's a reluctance to go against the kind of consensus economics. You got to raise interest rates. You can't raise taxes. You can't go after, you know, wealth in the society. Um, and so in some ways you could say that she didn't quite go after um, the real uh enemies you know that she needed to 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 um to to make a big change in in new zealand despite being a really well liked um and popular leader who inspired many people in new zealand and around the world professor marianne i uh, yeah i just want to ask a question is is uh, new zealand now under pressure to amp up their military like there was this coalition with the Western powers, Australia, now Japan, and you know, for the uh, anticipated confrontation with China. Yes. Um, well, you know, in fact, actually, that AUKUS, we talked about it on the show, the Australia-US-UK military alliance that ended up selling a US uh, nuclear submarine. I believe it was a nuclear submarine. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, to Australia that was very controversial and also ended up, um, you know, causing the cancellation of a f contract with a French uh, supplier uh, that caused the Europeans to be quite upset. Um, uh, that Jacinda Ardern actually expressed um, some concern that New Zealand hadn't even been invited to join. Now, I don't know exactly how she would have felt about okay. the terms of this kind of clearly anti-China sort of alliance that was creating, um, you know, uh, uh, an environment where there's going to be amped up and increased military sales and militarization. Uh, but she did, she was concerned, uh, and some commentators, and this is some of the criticism against, uh, against her, perhaps uh, domestically, is that in just the same way that the United, uh, that Canada feels very anxious when they're not a part of like the U.S., kind of alliance and certain elites feel very, you know, this happened when um, uh, under Chrétien, um, they decided not to join the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq. There was a lot of like anxiety about like, well, what happens to us if we're like cut out of the security arrangement with the United States? And I think New Zealand probably feels similarly Canada, about Canada. Australia and the U.S., that if they're not kind of included, this could be a dangerous uh, situation for them. So they might have felt impelled to join it if they had actually been invited. But it's interesting that they weren't. And I don't know exactly the reasons why New Zealand wasn't invited, um, other than perhaps that there really is very little military, uh, you know, kind of base there to work with. Uh, and that New Zealand has tried to chart a more neutral policy, perhaps um, in the region. Right. Professor Jonathan Bick, they uh, have referred to her as a bit of a neoliberal and Davos is taking place right now where neoliberals come to uh, plan the destruction of our planet. What's. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Let's talk about the debt ceiling first. 
All right. Well, uh, I, it just so happens that uh, the gentleman that I wanted to focus on was in Davos uh, when he made this statement. Uh, and that'd be uh, Senator Joe Manchin, who said in an interview on uh, Fox Business uh, that um, we have a debt problem. And he argued that uh, members of both parties should work together for a solution. And he singled out Social Security, mm. even though the program can't, by law, add to long term deficits. Social Security is uh, funded by primarily by a uh, payroll tax. We and, borrow from Social Security. Right. Don't we? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. So. Uh, you know, it, it's a ridiculous premise to start with. But what the, the Republicans want to cut Social Security. That is a prime objective and Medicare, by the way, uh, the two most important programs that the federal government provides to American citizens. Uh, now, uh, I'm sure that you'd agree with me, David, that uh, Manchin's constituents in West Virginia want their senator to be hobnobbing with the global financial elite in Davos, Switzerland, and to advocate for cutting their main source of income in their old age, right? Of course. Yeah, that's what they're looking for. Uh, well, that's what he's doing. And um uh, now, he did say he opposed privatizing Social Security, saying that such proposals, quote, scare the bejesus out of people, uh, which it should. Um, but he said we should be able to solidify it so the people who have worked and earned it uh, know what they're going to get. Well, they know what they're going to get. We get statements every year uh, from Social Security once you start getting uh, you know, in your 50s. And they tell you what you're going to get if if the government continues to uh, fund it the way it's been funded. Uh, but the problem is that the legislation that Manchin has introduced, along with Mitt Romney, uh, would establish bipartisan so-called rescue committees for the nation's trust fund programs, that is Social Security and Medicare, and give the panels six months to devise legislation that restores solvency and otherwise improves each. Um, the bills produced by the bipartisan committees would then be placed on an expedited path to floor votes in both chambers of Congress with no amendments allowed. In other words, these are fast track commissions and fast track has been used in the past to push unpopular legislation like NAFTA mm -hmm. through the legislature. Uh, Manchin and uh, Romney's legislation known as the Trust Act is modeled after the very unpopular Simpson Bowles Commission that recommended recommended deep cuts to Social Security in 2011. Former Republican Alan Simpson and former White House Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles, the Obama appointed chairs of the commission, both endorsed the Trust Act in 2021, calling the bill important and vital. Fortunately, the recommendations of the Simpson Bowles Commission uh, were ignored due to popular opposition and also, I would say, due to uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, which changed the conversation from austerity uh, to doing things that actually might actually help people in this country. Uh, so Social Security, as most people know, is financed through payroll taxes, and also it gets interest earned on previous surpluses that has, it has accumulated over the decades. It's been overfunded. It's a pay as you go system that's been overfunded because of the uh, the boomer gener generation, because there's a essentially, uh, uh, you know, a large group cohort going through 
uh, the social security system and it's that's disruptive to the pay as you go structure. So they created this uh, trust fund for social security and beefed it up uh, in the 1980s. So um, the uh, in his Fox News business interview on uh, on Wednesday, Manchin said his legislation could be used to secure a debt ceiling agreement with House Republicans who have threatened repeatedly to use the borrowing limit as leverage to push for Social Security cuts. Uh, he uh, Manchin, that is, uh, told the Fox host Maria Bartiromo the odious uh, Fox host, uh, that uh, he had briefly talked with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy about the Trust Act, asked about the White House stand against attaching any conditions to a debt ceiling agreement. Manchin said he really thinks the administration will reverse course and negotiate with the Republicans. Because previously, Biden said he would not negotiate with the Republicans regarding Social Security or Medicare. Um, and we got to make sure that he doesn't. Right? It, it, to, we got to put pressure on Biden and the Democrats to make sure that they do not negotiate with the Republicans uh, to harm Social Security or Medicaid or Medicare. Um, you know, we, this is the same thing that we saw in 2011 when politicians negotiated over the debt limit and ended up uh, strangling the economy with years of uh, cuts. So we don't want that to happen again. It's one of the reasons why we had such a slow recovery after the great uh, financial crisis. We don't want to have that again. There's already signs that the economy is slowing and uh, would not be a, a good thing. And I, and I should say that, you know, the average Social Security benefit for 2023 is going to be about seventeen hundred dollars, which is uh, equates Come to on. about twenty thousand four hundred dollars a year. What, what's not the poverty? What, what's the poverty level? The poverty level for an individual is uh, just under twenty thousand. So this is right above poverty level. Um, and to generate $20,000 a year, you know, if they got rid of Social Security, uh, particularly for younger people, uh, you would need $500,000 in safe investments to generate that kind of return. You know, if you invested in CDs or Treasury notes uh, at today's interest rates, you would get about $20,000 if you had half a million dollars. Most people don't have half a million dollars when they go into retirement. Um, in fact, um, a, uh, you know, the, the reason that uh, Social Security was set up and the way it was set up, it was to replace about a third of your uh, or provide about a third of your retirement income. It was called the three legged stool. So in addition to Social Security, you were supposed to have a private pension and personal savings. Well, private pensions have been disappearing in this country. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 22 percent of full time private industry workers uh, get a defined pension benefit which compares to 42% in 1990. So that's been about halved in, in that time. And it's going down because employers have said, why should we have to provide pensions? We'll just give them, you know, 401ks and they can take responsibility on their own. Right. Um, so it's, um, Th this is a critical issue that the people I don't think are paying attention to. And it's coming to a head because today we found out that the government hit the federal debt ceiling limit. Right. And the, the Treasury is going to have to resort to all sorts of extraordinary measures in order to uh, 
prevent the United States from defaulting on its debt, which could trigger a significant uh, economic crisis and result in even higher interest rates. So uh, this is a serious thing that people need to pay attention to. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Ann Lee, would you like to talk about the World Economic Forum and Davos and how it relates to Ukraine? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. I think that's a a good uh, entryway to where we need to talk about, uh, considering that we're probably going to be in a recession by the end of the year. Um, Davos, of course, is the uh, meeting of the World Economic Forum, which uh, usually gets a lot of coverage. Uh, It got more coverage when uh, Trump was in office because it was an opportunity for him to do whatever he was going to do. Um, I think the advantage was that we saw a little bit more about exactly what went on in Davos There's very little coverage in American media on Davos, which is quite interesting uh, at the current moment, other than an occasional mention that uh, uh, President Zelensky made a talk there. And this is against the background of uh, of Ukraine's uh, interior minister uh, being killed in a helicopter crash. Did he show uh, up? Was he was he in person or did it via video? Oh, he video. I think he videoed in. Uh, I think originally the plan was to for him physically to be there, but I think the uh, the helicopter crash really changed. I think the the nature of that because essentially it wiped out the top tier of the interior ministry, which was which was doing a lot of uh, coordinating rescue efforts and stuff. So anyway, Davos usually is a lightning rod for protests, and it's probably one of the worst uh, times. The projection that uh, that WEF has suggested it w- was seconded by the head of the IMF, and uh, it's not the Impossible Mission Force, but the uh, International Monetary Fund, which really is suggesting something about kind of America's position. And um, there's a pretty good article in uh, 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 Brave New Europe, which is a, a very s- small publication, but uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Michael Roberts is uh, writing about that uh, as formerly an economist with, uh, in the city of London. Uh, generally, the, the key points are that, uh, you know, world economic growth has slowed since the 1990s. Poverty has not been reduced for some 4 billion people on the planet, while inequality has risen. And these all track along with uh, some of the ways in which the U.S. economy, it's unfortunate, but the way the U.S. economy was organized. And there I'm are, sorry, of course, obvious up, geopolitical US tensions. Economy was what, I'm sorry, you broke up. The U.S. economy was... Uh, fragmented fragmented. Uh, since the Reagan era. And uh, it's it's signified, in fact, by some of the issues that relate to Russia, Ukraine, which currently is having in parallel a meeting in Rammstein tomorrow of all of the defense ministers of uh, the NATO powers, a variety of folks, all of whom are giving more equipment to Ukraine, which is what Ukraine has been wanting. And uh, the U.S. is slowing up a little bit on it, but I think it's being forced forward. Germany is acting weird for a variety of interesting reasons. Um for example, the Swiss make the electronics for some German tanks. So therefore, the Swiss are blocking the Germans from allowing German tanks to be used in Ukraine, which is just we're back to World War One again, essentially, with stupid interlocking uh, constraints. But anyway, um, the point that uh, this fellow Roberts is making is that hegemony, U.S. hegemony built around globalization and the moderation of the 80s, the Reagan era is up to the the uh, turn of the century, it's over. And it's generally a, a downbeat thing. No one wants to be, you know, um, uh, cheerleading for for uh, growth because uh, the problems are already incredibly problematic. Uh, global economic growth is going to decline over the next year. And it's probably one of the most pessimistic uh, forecasts uh, 
So, you know, without talking about gloom and doom, it's not so, so much gloom and doom. We know that it's happening that way now. Uh, the interesting question is whether activists are going to respond to that, whether the left responds to that. And the current buzzword, it's a buzzword I don't use, and I actually haven't read it that far, but it's interesting. I, I think probably uh, the neoliberals have uh, played with it, uh, is the idea of a poly crisis that is interlocking multiple crises. That is, you have inflation and slump coming up. You have both the climate and pandemic uh, environmental crises. And then, of course, the obvious geopolitical uh, you know, war and international division, which is in Ukraine now, but probably could leak over to Taiwan. Now, the, the IMF head uh, uh, by the name of Kristalina Georgieva uh, warns that a third of the global economy would be hit by recession this year, 2023. So we're going to have decline in real GDP growth, uh, not officially a recession, but it'll feel like one. And I think the, the issue of supply chain problems and et cetera are not going to go away. So it's uh, generally a bad forecast on this on that side. On the other hand, why is that happening? Well, it's because the wealthier, the rich got richer and the poor got shafted. Uh, and this is not unusual for the last 50 years or so. <laughs> but the reality, of course, is that global wealth reached a, is getting towards 500 trillion. And global wealth uh, rose of almost 10 percent uh, in 2021. And it, it's far above the annual, you know, sort of uh, a six percent, which is generally what it's been since uh, 2000. And then if you exclude currency movements, you know, global wealth grew by about 10 to 12 percent. Now, the problem, of course, is that none of this gets distributed and this rise is uh, on the one hand, a good thing. On the other hand, it's not trickling down. It's due to rising property prices and credit fueled stock market. You know, a boom in the stock market, which, as we know from the Trump era, that's all they yacked about. Um, so the problem is all that money went to rich people. And so the, the numbers are in 2021, the top 1% now owns 48 point, uh, 48 percent of all personal wealth. And while 2.8 billion own just 1.1 percent, and the top 13 percent of the people in the world own 86 percent of all wealth. Now that's just, by any measure, not equitable. No. So there are some solutions, or not, if it, if not solutions, at least ways in which the coming crisis can be sort of worked through, and that is you know, strengthening international trade system because it's it's really messed up, as we've seen with the supply chain problems and and also to help vulnerable countries deal with their debt. And and nothing is being helped by the Ukraine war because this it's going to be ugly, the post-war period, whenever that happens. And then, of course, climate action, which is happening. And so, you know, on the one hand, you could say, well, wow, this is hopeful sign, right direction, economic integration that brings peace and property to all. And the rest is just, you know, arm waving and people making deals. Uh, I think Kushner went to uh, uh, Jared Kushner went to uh, uh, Davos, is in Davos right now. So the, these are the kinds of problems that we're currently confronting, not not easily solved. And the last thing I want to talk about is Christopher Rufo, who. That's it's Florida. amazing. You talk to Florida. You're going to talk about Florida, right? Yeah. Not that I, you know, I. Uh, we hold. Can we, we just? Own... Can I get a reaction? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Before we go, uh, before we leave Switzerland and go to Florida, yeah. <laughs> would, would anybody like to comment on uh, Davos? Yeah, I'd like to ask Professor Ann. I mean, how relevant is the WEF going to be in the next 10 to 20 years? I mean, one of the things that Lula did at, when he was after he was sworn in was reiterate his support of BRICS, which is like <laughs> half the world's population, at least, and growing. Brazil, and this, Russia, India. Uh, Brazil, China. Russia, uh, India, China, and I believe South, South Africa. 
yeah. South, South Africa. Africa. And there are many countries like Iran wanting you know, that are wanting to join. And they seem to have a very different model than, you know, military bases all over the planet. And, um, you know, the other question is, is anybody in the WEF even questioning the, because the problems of, you know, uh, supply chains, uh, wealth inequality, I mean, uh, pollution, exploitation, these are all deep problems of capitalism. And is anyone at the WEF even politely suggesting that people may have to like start changing their you know, fundamentally dearly held beliefs about capitalism being able to solve our current problems. Right. Yeah. I, well, just to respond, uh, we're still in kind of war Keynesianism and I don't think we're leaving that the whole issue of uh, literally uh, 12 or nine to 12 countries donating weapons to Ukraine is also because at the back end, the United States has promised to backfill all of the equipment that is going to Ukraine. In other words, uh, you're, you're going to get transfers of American tanks and missile systems and a whole bunch of other things. They're going to backfill all the equipment that's leaving European country inventories to go to Ukraine. And the, the bet is, of course, that Ukraine you know, will be probably one of the most well-armed countries in the world by the end of the war, whatever that might be. But that's a reality. At the end of every war we've had, almost uh, right. the whatever military we fought with wound up being a huge uh, major power wherever it was. Right. So that's pretty wanna, much the same game. Right. I want to turn to Ukraine in a second, but Professor Adnan Hussein had Noam Chomsky on the Gorilla podcast, Gorilla History podcast. And that was the first time I heard the term war, Keynesian, uh, war. Military Keynesian. Military Keynesian. Keynesian. Yeah, explain what that is briefly, please. Well, I think it's um, people may be uh, familiar with the prime, yeah. the pump, prime, just, the pump. You can hear me, we're getting thunderstorm. I, hang on for one second. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. We we just got hit by a bolt of lightning. So hang on for mm. one second. Uh oh. Yeah. So uh, my my power supply. Hang on. I guess those are Never. candles in the background. There. We just got. I mean. There. You hear, do you hear Never that? criticize Keynes. Mm. <laughs> Hang on. All right. So what I need to do, this was so good. Let me leave and come back. Thank you. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Just smoke them if <laughs> smoke, smoke them. Smoke them if you have them. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, I did see. I didn't really hear that old Al Gore spoke in Davos this year. Ah, well, what do you have to say? Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't follow that. Um, I was more amused by the idea that uh, the BRICS countries are actually getting stronger. The, you mm -hmm. know, uh, India has uh, really been on the move and. They've been the BRICS countries are aligning, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, I think South Africa uh, took some position. I can't remember what it was. There's something today where they they took a position that was actually fairly hostile, which was sort of interesting. Um, a hostile to whom and over what? <laughs> I, I think it was uh, it was about military aid. Um, I can't remember what it was. I, I just saw it before it came on. Um, but. It, it just I thought, well, that's sort of different. Um, and I think that generally there's some destabilizing going on, but it's moving more in that direction. I mean, Lula in Brazil, you know, is definitely more 
on the side of Russia, whatever that means. Um, I, I think that there are people who are aligning themselves in various directions and we're getting a little bit more uh, bifurcation in, in that sense. So, Do you think it's really pro-Russia or is it just anti-U.S. Well, hegemony? I mean, look, you know, it, China is there's building anti-imperialism and there's anti-imperialism. <laughs> but, I mean, China is well, building Lauren, a high-speed rail in Africa. I mean, we leave the Amazon in Ecuador polluted and, you know, uh, the the indigenous people that got no a dis- billion there's dollars. There's no, dis- yeah? no disagreement here. And but that's kind it, of, it, you know, I think if that I could, if I could smash the state, I would. <laughs> More anyway. importantly, was Greta Thunberg able to take Bono aside at Davos and have a word with him? Oh, they probably party <laughs> together. They go to the same parties now, I'm sure. I think they, Davos. Went, they went to a Romanian pizza place, didn't they? Um, well, I don't know. The, well, um, you know, let's uh, consult Al Gore's Internet, shall we? Are the Romanians oh. known for their pizza? Uh, well, that, was, <laughs> that came up with right. that guy. Uh, what was his name? Nick Tate? or. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my mother. Hello. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi Hello. mom. <laughs> so you're in the Detroit area. Yeah. Michigan. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if we wanted to be precise, Lula called for peace. Okay, so now it seems that calls for peace are inevitably characterized as being pro-Russia for some reason. So um, I think he was fairly careful with his remarks and certainly did not come out on anybody's side exactly, but actually called for negotiations, a peace, and for the parties to find common ground to end the conflict, he said. That's what he wished for. And that he's further added, in Brazil, we have a tradition of defending the integrity of nations, and we're going to talk to whoever is possible for peace. So I think he's saying, essentially, that you can't be in favor of Russia's invasion, but on the other hand, you also need to look for solutions that would bring peace and stability and resolve this conflict. So I I wouldn't say that he came out as sort of a pro-Russian, but he yeah. came out in favor of peace. I, he was yeah. wasn't that his big push. I mean, he was one of the initiators of this. Uh, I guess it, you would call it like an economic union or economic coalition Not exactly. of the BRICS. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. happened because of him, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, not just because of him, but he was one of the principal figures. And it was during it was formed during his presidency. And uh, you pointed out, I think, a really uh, good uh, point there, um, Marianne, about uh, how many other countries also would like to join. I know um, Turkey has expressed interest in joining Saudi Arabia has expressed interest in joining. Okay, so we are seeing something like a major realignment that is really being caused um, more by the insistence on the United States that you have to join in in their sanctions regimes, in their so-called rules based order. And, um, you know, many other countries would like to have the option to trade with and have negotiations and positive relations with a variety of countries and are less concerned about polarizing the world into these camps. Um, So that's just going to be something the U S discovers is that, um, you know, it seems to be able to have much of a hold on Europe uh, at least in, in its relationship to Russia, but even that grip is weakening when it comes to um, European countries and, their desired trade relations and diplomatic relations with China. So well, you know, why is multi- Olaf Scholz showing up in, in Beijing, you know, the only foreign leader in the post-COVID uh, period um, from the West um, 
you know, to have, have gone. Uh, in fact, actually of any leader, really. I mean, I think he's among the first to have, have visited and have had talks. And I think it's because they're looking for a way to try and maintain some kind of trade relationship for integration of Europe and Asia. I mean, it's just normal. Well, and there was better integration before, with all due respect to Trump. I mean, essentially trying to take apart dismantle uh, multilateral traditions with, you know, badly configured bubble tariff, pseudo tariff wars was really created a huge problem. If you had four years to that kind of stupidity, you know, we're we're still digging out of that. I mean, you know, it. I mean, it is, of course, symptomatic of other problems like the pandemic, et cetera. But the fact is, and and this is a problem with Biden, he's not taking enough leadership in that area. But, uh, you know, it got really screwed up by by Trump. I mean, it, things just did not go the way they were supposed to. So they should have gone and probably would have gone, uh, even though we have all been annoyed with uh, with Hillary in charge. Uh, I think it would have moved more towards multilateral, um, you know, some kind of this alignment wouldn't be quite so extreme. I think that's what we're getting right now. And, you know, it, 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 uh, you know, Belt and Road has made a, you know, it's proceeded in a very positive direction. And I, you know, I think that's actually a very good, ultimately it's always a good thing and, you know, fits in general with, with, uh, what Obama tried to move, you know, move, uh, uh, international relations into that is an Indo-Pacific sort of construction, which I think is much better. I think that's really better for the international, for the international order, and also for the global economy. Um, but uh, I don't know. You know, this is uh, uh, we're still in a really bad place, and and I agree that there's the war should end quicker. The problem, of course, is I think. Uh, uh, Putin is not in a good place. I mean, he's just not in a good place. He's he's you know, it, it, things are desperate. The people, the knives are beginning to come out. Oh, I don't know, Professor. And I think that is one perspective. <laughs> there are Who's other knives? perspectives on that. Whose um, knives are well, coming out? Uh, well, knives I don't know. Pro- coming out Prigozhin, in Ukraine. No, no, no. If Prigozhin, you know, gets a little bit more power in the whatever it is, this uh, Siloviki uh, elite kind of gains even more power. There will be something will happen. I don't know. You know, we'll see. Uh, otherwise, just more people are going to die. I mean, I just think all of these it's just awful, needless deaths that, uh, you know, are just going to get worse because there's going to be a major there's going to be a major offensive, whether it's Russia's offensive or a Ukrainian counteroffensive, a lot more people are going to die by the summer. Um, and well, uh, America's military, not doing a good job. Doesn't care about that and never has. I mean, there's more than a million civilian deaths and counting now when we're really trying to get an accounting of the Iraq war. I mean, there's absolutely been no consequence for any of the architects of that war. Oh, and of yeah. course, the beneficiaries um, war. I mean, the Afghan war. What what did that accomplish except death? I mean, the wars that okay. are going on in Africa right now. I mean, it just seems that that is kind of the balloon that needs to be kept inflated, underpinning our economy. Yes, is constant war, and that's well, what, what we were we... talking about. Um... With the military Keynesianism, I don't know if David is going to come back or when he's going to come back, but that is the thread that we were talking about is the way in which the United States economy and the vast majority of its government spending, um, which floats its economy, is in the military, industrial and security and surveillance uh, apparatus, you know, and industries. Um and that is the particular technological and economic advantage that the United States has. It doesn't have it any longer in a lot of other areas of manufacturing because so much has been actually offshored to places like China that it is now 
competing with in a more um, geopolitical and strategic way. But this is a sort of fake and false, uh, you know, problem, it seems to me, since um, in reality, well, there's so much interdependence between, you know, certainly over the last 20, 30 years. And it doesn't seem like China is interested in a dramatic change in that interdependence. Can you hear me? But it's the United States that is, um, you yes. know. Could hear yes, you, David. We can. We had a a thunderstorm, and it completely blew out my. It's never happened. My soundboard completely got blown out. Uh, is it working? I mean, I think are you so. back up and working? Yeah. Do you mind talking? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> no. We were, you know. Do we mind? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see. I'm recording here, and thankfully, we're recording. Uh, okay. in the cloud. Sorry about that. Uh, so everybody can hear me, no correct? Yeah, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you were talking about Keynesian, uh, military, correct? Yeah. Military Keynesianism, right. which I also, uh, was introduced to the term by Noam Chomsky in his recent book with Vijay Prashad, The Withdrawal. And um, it was sort of a review of many of his ideas and his work over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and this idea of military Keynesianism, people, of course, are familiar with John Maynard Keynes, the important economist whose theories about, uh, you know, priming the pump and creating demand through government spending in order to get out of a uh, recession or a depression um, were very important in lifting the United States um, out of the depression uh, and were implemented by FDR's administration. Um, but of course, the largest uh, aspect of government spending during that period that did also have a real dramatic effect on the U.S. economy was World right. War II and the production of armaments and supplying them even before the United States got involved in the war, it was supplying and provisioning Britain. And it carried on after that um, with uh, having the most powerful military um, and um, all of the interests uh, around its production um, have continued to receive a lot of government largesse and his point, Noam Chomsky's point, was is that you could characterize the current U.S. economy and imperial system as being built around a military Keynesianism. So it's not just public spending in a variety of ways in social programs and full employment, in infrastructure projects and all of the things that were so important uh, in um, the New Deal and in that era under FDR, but it is specifically spending uh, directed to the military industrial complex right. and all of its allied industries that form basically the, the, the structure of the U.S. economy. Right. So what I'd like to do is let's do Professor Mary, uh, Professor Lee's update on Ukraine and then come back later to talk about Florida. Is that okay, Professor Lee? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. So, uh, Professor Ann Lee writes a nightly update on the war in Ukraine. We're coming up almost on a year, right? Yes, we are. Very soon. Next month. And uh, everyone's contributing now. I mean, uh, today's news is that Belgium is going to send Ukraine 3,000 tons of road salt, which has all kinds of other uh, consequences. <laughs> but uh, there's a big meeting in Rammstein uh, tomorrow of the, the allied military leaders, and it's going to be a lot of agreement uh, in parallel with Davos uh, about uh, transferring a lot of equipment from a bunch of countries. I mean, Latvia, Estonia, they're giving up uh, actually fairly large portions of their military hardware to Ukraine. But the whole point is, this is all like taking certain pieces of inventory that are now 
reaching the kind of prime or late prime of their their shelf life and transferring it so that it's actually being used in battle. So, you know, it's uh, it's a boon for not only American military Keynesianism, but EU military Keynesianism. So, for example, the, uh, a significant number of French uh, mobile howitzers, and that may not seem like it's important, but the, most of the battles of Ukraine have been artillery barrages. And so a significant amount of French mobile howitzers are going to Ukraine. I know that seems relatively uh, trivial on the one hand. On the other hand, that is where all the damage and all the deaths are coming is Mm. by uh, artillery bombardment rather than uh, cruise missiles. Although almost 50 people have died from that one cruise missile strike in Dnipro. And uh, uh, it wasn't helped by the helicopter crash. So what's coming up is a uh, Ukraine still wants more weapons. Um, people are still getting bombarded every day. Uh, uh, air raid sirens are going off and uh, the losses are somewhere. And, and no one is, has an accurate measure of 200,000 some odd people uh, may have died in this war. We don't really know. Um, but it is interesting that that a significant number of Western, whatever Western European countries have decided to pitch in. But I think from a political point of view, they're pitching in because they were kind of forced to, they were sort of bullied into this Ramstein meeting because it sort of parallels the Davos meeting. And all of these things have little elements that connect with each other, that, that pressure each other. And uh, so that's what's, that's kind of what's going on. And unfortunately, the discussion is also about tanks, and it 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 harkens back to World War II, but it is kind of about tank battles, and it's sort of sad to see it that way. But that's the kind of discourse that is going on um, amidst all of that. Is as I I mentioned earlier, this weird thing about Switzerland about Switzerland objecting to Leopold II tanks coming from Germany to to Ukraine and objecting because Swiss electronics are in German tanks. And it's just the weirdest kind of objection that they've made to transferring. And so the Germans are and, and using that they, to say why, well, because of they're afraid it would fall into Russian hands and they could no, they're just insisting on their neutrality. Oh, and so I they see. wanted to stay on everybody's good side and considering that the significant amount of money goes through Swiss bank, Swiss investments, this is why they've done that. But, but it is kind of a weird objection. And the way I wanted to close on that was by saying, you know, it is all about still it's about World War II in that context. Uh it's it's just the strangest thing to see the kind of Cold War elements being s- still reintroduced. And it's uh, I actually it's sort of important because there's a lot of this stuff that isn't quite revealed to us, you know, that there's a significant number of uh, U.S. tanks that are sitting in Jordan and that there's all this ammuni- American ammunition sitting in Israel. And that's all getting transferred to Ukraine or, well, not the Jordanian tanks, but the um, uh, American uh, ammunition in Israel is going to Ukraine. So it's essentially all back to the Keynesian, the uh, military Keynesian economy. All of these things are the true measure of what the war is about. And unfortunately, diplomacy, I mean, Putin refuses to negotiate. His front end position is that he's not going to negotiate. He presumes that he's going to win this war, which doesn't look very possible. And most people now say it's not going to happen, but he's certainly going to cause enough chaos so that maybe his concession, the concessions he wants will remain. I think that's what the way it's going to the it's it's up to Ukraine, essentially, if they're going to meet their goals, which is to uh, bring Ukraine back to the pre 2014 borders. Regardless of all the other discourse around that, it's it's a really important issue. So anyway, that's that's all of all of that. <laughs> well, we can read. You can read. Thank, we can read <clears throat> Professor Annie 
Ann Lee, she writes under the name Annie Lee over at the <clears> Daily Kos. <throat> Before I bring in Professor Marianne Cummings to talk about how much information we can actually get about this, you said that it's Putin who refuses to negotiate, Professor Ann Lee. Well, the front end declaration of the last couple of days by Lavrov, the foreign minister, and Putin is that they refuse to, it's, they don't want to negotiate because they think they're going to win. Uh, it's very Russian right. positioning on, on that issue. Uh, doubtless, there's actually conversations going on. I think there are always conversations going on, but uh, any, getting anybody to an actual table, to an actual summit is still problematic. And I don't think it's, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen within the next month or two. Okay. So before that's bring, my b- Before I bring in Professor Marianne Cummings, a lot of people believe that if we wanted peace talks, it would be Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken and Putin would come to the table and that they're, that, that we're the obstacle to the peace talks. But you're, you're saying from your research that it is Putin right now who is refusing to negotiate. Well, it, I, he, he's responding to, I think, this uh, weapons buildup that's happening. And also uh, he's going to announce a second major or uh, what might be is probably a full mobilization of his his country. So he, he can't negotiate and mobilize at the same time. There's going to be an announcement about a remobilization of another 150 to 300,000 troops. Um, those the whether he actually he already, gets them is a whole different question. Uh, a couple of months ago, he called up all these troops and a lot of them headed for the border. Is this a new mobilization or is this the fruits of that mobilization? No, this is a new mobilization. A There's new been discussion. One. A new mobilization. That's that's why he can't say that we're going to and. To reinforce that point, he put air defense missiles on top of major buildings in Moscow. So he's running a PR campaign. He can't negotiate while he's putting anti-aircraft air defense in Moscow. Even though there's no threat of anything happening, this is all, you know, PR. But it's kind of interesting to see that happening. Okay, Professor Marianne, you wanted to talk about how difficult it is to find out what's really going on well um yeah i i kind of remember colin powell speaking in front of the u.n and i was literally screaming at my friend's house i had my laptop on my lap watching this tv you could anybody with a laptop and any reasonable knowledge of the situation could have debunked every goddamn lie he said in real time and nothing nothing from our press i mean it was just it was eerie and this we're talking almost 20 years ago 20 years ago right eerie how people who really should have known better uh did not speak up they were afraid to because when you get this kind of pro war fever it's like professor ann says you know with our allies we're going to war where Ukraine is going to win this. You're going to help us. And it's really hard when you've got that momentum going to really uh, buck against that. Now, many of the things that became places that became my go to sites for information were people who were brave enough to and knowledgeable enough to, you know, refute, refute everything that was going on at the time. One of them was Consortium News, which still remains to this day a place that I go to for people who are not afraid to, you know, the kind of thing you can't say on ABC Nightly News, unless you were Peter Jennings on occasion. Um, The other one was Moon of Alabama. Uh, Noam Chomsky praised that. used to go to that site quite a bit. Um, We don't know who the guy is that runs it, except that his first name is Bernard, but they were getting stuff right. He's obviously connected to the military. They were getting stuff right. Um, and he was also just would go all over the world with information outside of the U.S. press anyway. And, and so even though 
people are su- suspect because no one knows who this Bernard is. All of his stuff is very well sourced. And, you know, it's, a lot of the stuff is just open source. You can get it. The other uh, the other one was the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. And these guys, again, uh, you know, they McGovern. Is that McGovern? Well, that was McGovern. Uh, who was it? McGovern, that was William sure. Binney. Uh, Scott Ritter was yeah. part of that. There was like several people who were were part of this. Um, I don't know if. Um, Postel was was part of this uh, of, of this consortium, but you know he would he would write for them, and they would often have him on on their programs. But you see, there was just a ring of people that were truth tellers that didn't get rewarded. By the way, I mean they're till this day they are vilified in the press now by by liberals because most of these people were Republicans. William Binney, you know Scott Scott Ritter. Uh, McGovern, Ray McGovern, all these people were you know, not ideologically. It's just that most people that come up who grow up through the intelligence services, especially during the Cold War, were Republican. I mean, that was just kind of the culture. Like most of the people that come up through the military are just default Republican with no real ideological, you know, uh, kind of. It, it, leanings they just that's their where their parents were that's everybody in their unit you know so that's it so and it it's just amazing that all all of the press that got the iraq war wrong never i mean n- never suffered the consequences for it they had their well, the new york times the new york times apologized <laughs> years ago <laughs> yeah. well, it did but i mean they did. miller they did oh, but uh, Chris Hedges, remember, he was one of the he was one of the editors at the New York Times at the time at that point and was basically publicly calling them out for journalistic malfeasance, particularly when they had a series of above the fold articles by Judith Miller. Remember her uh, single sourced. No one could get confirmation, but yet a lot of these articles were driving the war. And and despite millions of us being on the street protesting, the fact was, is that the day after uh, the day after we attacked Iraq, um, W's approval rating shot up past 73 percent. So, you know, that and and it's very, very hard when you've got the drum in the similar thing. Maybe not as momentous, but I think long term kind of damaging was this whole Russiagate nonsense. I mean, people were you never heard any dissenting voices to this whole. I would call it a conspiracy. It was it was a narrative. It was a narrative. They just could not. The Democratic Party could not get their minds wrapped around losing to this talk show host. So they had to come up with something exotic. And I think more practically, if they wanted to get Trump, and I think this is how Trump and his entire family and his dad has escaped prosecution for decades, is that if you, what they're really guilty of, if you start taking down the Trump empire that way, you start taking down a whole lot of other people, even when it comes to their the financial dealings. I thought the one substantive thing that would come out of uh, Mueller's investigation was his crack team, 20 prosecutors that were you know, going to go after Deutsche Bank and going to start, and start investigating Trump's ties to Deutsche Bank. The problem is, again, you start pulling on any thread that Trump might be involved in and you start stringing along a whole bunch of other people. So this is so this is a problem. So, you know, we do have Al Gore's Internet and these people are there and Consortium News has been uh, Joe Luria and all these people have been consistently uh, speaking out. Uh, Theater Postal, MIT professor, he debunked the first um, the the, uh, gas attack that was that was supposedly the red line that Assad had crossed. And it was on the basis of his study that Obama held back from sending troops over to Syria. And, and he similarly debunked the, uh, the so-called sarin attack uh, that Assad, uh, Assad supposedly did that uh, in 2017 that led to Trump's performative bombing and 
everybody, including Dick Durbin, applauding Trump, like finally he's a real president because he bombed another country, presumably. Now, Theater Postal gets in there and like he did back in 2013, his crew analyzed the situation and there was a paper, I even have the paper right here, Computational Forensic Analysis of the Chemical Weapons Attack at Khan Shikun on April 4th, 2017. And basically, they uh, had uh, questioned the uh, OPCW, that's the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Warfare. I think that's, it's a UN. And because that investigation had concluded that the Assad regime had used sarin. Well, there's been a subsequent uh, shakedown of that report. It turns out people like Robert Fisk, Aaron Maté, other reporters at the BBC have, uh, you know, investigated this. It was a real scandal that that initial report, the the initial report by the O uh, by the OPCW, had had concluded that no, he hadn't done it. And these were this were the scientists and the people who understood these kind of the forensics people who understood this kind of thing. And of course, you know, uh, Theater Postal, being in one of the leaders in the field, his his team had done their investigation. Um, they were refused publication in one of the leading uh, uh, material science, sciences journals. And let's see, um, I can't remember, I'm, I'm trying to pull up the name of, uh, oh yeah, it was Science and Global Security Journal. It was turned down, and it was turned down because even though the report was technically correct, it was not helpful. So real world information that could lead to war is not helpful. So we turn to our uh, our friend, Ivan Kachanovsky. Now, um, I think he's a, this is a very interesting Twitter feed because you will, since I don't read Russian, I re, re, used to be able to read it a little bit 35 years ago. But I don't do Google searches in Russian or in Ukraine. It's very useful to have someone like him who does. And he has been, as you know, he has been studying the Maidan, uh, the, the Maidan revolution. It was the Maidan massacre that one day where over 50 people were, uh, were killed, over 100 people altogether. Um, you know, there's been a trial of those policemen who were accused of shooting the uh, in Kiev this past year, it's been going on. They've been accused of shooting uh, the, the the policemen accused of shooting the Maidan protesters. It turns out the defense used heavily Professor Kachikovsky's studies and his team, and over fifty witnesses who were shot but survived had testified that they were not shot by the police. They were shot by snipers from the direction of the Maidan, built one of the Maidan buildings, but the buildings that the uh, le leadership had had taken control over. Well, um, Professor Kachikovsky has also put in his latest uh, uh, paper to an international journal, and it was peer reviewed, and it was, you know, it was highly recommended, and it was turned down for publication for the same reason that if you if you really go against the narrative that you know uh, that that the Maidan was a peaceful protest rather than a violent coup, um, that is not useful given the current war situation in Ukraine. So again, it's like you know, uh, whereas I thought there was a little more of the left that was questioning the narrative leading up to the Iraq war, I mean, a lot of the left right now is just putting trust in people that have basically lied us into every single war in my lifetime and probably earlier. So it's it's a real it's a real problem. You know, how do you find you know you of course you can never know anything, everything about a situation, but you can find people who ask honest questions and who have the kind of background and integrity to ask those questions and, you know, probe the evidence. 
and they're so precious few in in, in our media right now. And uh, you know, so I guess, and and that's why I find myself, you know, getting into big arguments with friends and getting everybody pissed off. You know, it's like, hey, I'm sorry, I, it was the same way during the Iraq War. You know, um, and less serious, but, you know, I, I, I bring up the whole Russiagate nonsense because even though there are aspects of it that were quite amusing, like, you know, the the memes on Facebook and Twitter that that were supposedly <laughs> supposedly swung the election that was pretty much debunked in The Washington Post and Jacobin writes about that. But it really did something far more damaging. It It basically got the left to go to be anti-journalist, there, there's no outcry about the treat, treatment of Julian Assange, to be anti-whistleblower, to be pro-FBI and CIA, to be, and, and, and in general, you know, uh, and also just per, personally, it was kind of a swipe at the people who were supporters of Bernie Sanders, because after all, don't we feel some, some responsibility for Hillary losing, we might have all been unwitting Russian dupes. Right. Okay. That's that was a real hat trick. Right. That whole. So even though it's been debunked, the damage has been done. And now we are facing a war where there I think there is a just irrational hatred, irrational hatred of Putin, of Putin and Russians. Okay. You know, it it's like to me, every single Every single leader of a country that matters on this planet is probably a sociopath or at least does a reasonable, you know, impression of impersonation of one when you have to deal with real power and real, you know, and and, and real bad situations in this world. All right. I let's move on. Uh, OK, I disagree with you about the irrational hatred of Vladimir Putin, but. Uh, Why should you but, hate them at all? I mean, it's no, like Vladimir if Putin. you have a hatred, you can't Vladimir, deal with people. Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin. I mean, OK, um, let's let's wrap this up talking. Oh, uh, Professor Hussein, you have your hand raised. Oh, just quickly on 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 that. Um, uh, I, I came across a really good uh, conversation Chris Hedges had with people who are dealing with with um this question about uh media sources and um uh the polarized atmosphere because we can't you know actually have any you know consensus sources anymore and uh Nolan Higdon and Mickey Huff and they have a new book Let's Agree to Disagree a right. critical thinking guide to communication conflict management and critical media literacy and it was actually a quite a good uh conversation about how to navigate this uh this environment and um i would recommend we try and get them yeah we on, had perhaps we had that Mickey might Huff be a good, the show. good conversation yeah, but agree. just about yeah. this uh putin uh thing is that um putin is being pushed he's not just making these decisions on his own i mean the communist party and all of the other opposition parties uh to uh, Putin all agreed and 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 thought that uh, the uh, taking of Crimea was absolutely necessary and important. And of course, the further right wing uh, nationalists, Russian extreme Russian nationalists, were pushing him at that time to go much further than just taking Crimea, but to take the steps that he now has has taken eight years later. And he has suffered quite a lot of criticism from those sorts of forces that he was soft, constantly looking for diplomacy um, and making these kind of overtures and uh, talking about the problem without really marshalling uh, Russia's, uh, you know, kind of aggressive military might to solve the problem because uh, they believed that the West couldn't be trusted and had no intention of, um, you know, that the, all they want to do is keep the great Russian nation down, etc. And now, you know, with uh, what has happened and with the th things Merkel said 
And, uh, you know, they now can say, well, look, the uh, Minsk Accords were a hoax and that the Western leaders were lying. And so the question about diplomacy is who do we trust now since they negotiated and we negotiated in good faith. But now, you know, it's clear that Merkel is admitting that it was just a mechanism to you know, delay the end, you know, to delay um, making any real commitments and allow the arming and training of of Ukraine. And now the moon of Alabama suggests that that might not be correct. And that, you know, Merkel is kind of making this ex post facto to justify, you know, the fact that she had been willing to negotiate before and guarantee the Minsk Minsk Accords. Um, But Poroshenko said the same thing. Um, that, you know, this was great. It gave us the opportunity to, you know, prepare for eight years. And Francois Hollande recently, who was the other Western leader, um, you know, from France, he was prime minister at the time of France, recently said also essentially confirming that they didn't have any intention of really carrying out the Minsk Accords and that there were ulterior motives. So, I also think maybe there's some making up of history and 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 shaping it to fit the new position. But you have several people who are, who were there who are at least exonerating themselves um, in this particular fashion, which all makes it a credible claim from the Russian perspective that the West has no good faith negotiations. And who exactly at this point is asking Putin to negotiate from? Is there a U.S. official, a senior U.S. official in the State Department or in the Biden administration that is seriously saying, let's have negotiations and here's what we propose to meet and so on? No. So when, you know, people say that Putin is refusing, you know, negotiations, who exactly is offering negotiations? What kind of a is it a meaningful statement to say that when, in fact, we have had, you know, in April, in March and April, evidence of genuine negotiations that were taking place and that were derailed by uh, Britain and and the United States. So um, I just find some of the discussion about it that's happening in the mainstream media just very incredible. Um, And, um, you know, I would I would I would say that, um, you know, that we're never going to get to any real pressure um, on, um, you know, our leaders to move to negotiation if we keep emphasizing the kind of points about Mo- Putin is a madman. Maybe he is, you know, like, but the point is, is that we're not going to make any progress if we allow a personalization of Russia's invasion as the, you know, megalomaniacal decision of one man that belies the realities of the Russian political situation. We have to take that into account so that we know that, you know, just removing Putin is not really going to solve any of this, any of this problem, because the problem has been built up over the course of several decades of policy decisions that have created this condition. And now it's very difficult to get out of it. And we're certainly not going to get out of it by making this a comic book of like, you know, uh, villains and, um, you know, and heroes. Um, I think that's just a a recipe for, for disaster, more bloodshed and more plunging of the whole world into economic recession. I mean, there's got to be a different, a different path. And it's really disturbing that there is no real voices on the left, certainly among the elected left that are, representing a movement, a a movement uh, to push for peaceful resolution. And if I could just add to that, uh, recently I've read that the uh, Biden administration is now entertaining the idea of assisting Ukraine in taking back Crimea. Uh, Should this happen, Uh, You know, this would be so unacceptable for uh, Putin and I I would imagine many in Russia that uh, who knows what he would do, how he would react. This is an escalation of this war um, that I think is extremely dangerous. And uh, and I agree with Professor Hussein, uh, you know, this is not something that would just occur in the last decade or so. This has been 
a problem in the making for decades. And if we ignore that, I mean, I, you know, I've asked this before, but uh, people don't think, I don't know, they don't agree with it. But, um, you know, if, if Canada had an election and China intervened in Canada to help overthrow the elected leader of Canada, uh, and then well, an uh, argument, the argument is that Putin has been interfering in Western elections. <laughs> West I that buff Bernie rainbow Bernie meme. I mean, uh, you know, we've been interfering in Europe uh, since forever. Right. Um, yeah. And, and we excluded Russia uh, from NATO. We increased the size of NATO after the exi- the the reason for the existence of NATO had disappeared. You know, and, and and people are saying it's unreasonable for Russia to think that NATO would ever be a threat to it. Is it? Why not? They've, you know, been involved in invading Afghanistan. They've, you know, bombed Libya. They've been, you know, in, you know, U.S. has been involved in, in Syria. They're talking about a NATO for the Pacific, um, you know, that NATO has to have some kind of operational capacity and mission to, you know, work in the South China Sea. In other words, you know, NATO has to confront China. I mean, you know, why wouldn't one think that NATO is an aggressive military organization that interferes in sovereign countries around the world? It's that's just history. Right. But that doesn't uh, diminish the fact that Putin is interfering in our election. Oh, of course. OK, so like, well, I, so I don't what? know. I mean, but what like, does let's that stipulate that to do with so anything. what? Well, what does I that mean, matter in the end? In the end, did it make a difference or not? It, you know, and also, you know, the U.S. is so much better at interfering in elections around the world. You know, should other countries declare war on the United States? Because, you know, there's been I mean, should I mean, third party countries, I mean, should Russia and should China, you know, it's it's just we have this perspective that um, that um exaggerates uh, anything that happens to us or that matters to us without, you know, any understanding of what happens to others and what matters to others. I mean, there's no way that we can, you know, engage effectively in the world if we don't accept some sense of proportion and reciprocity, that things look differently to, you know, others. And we have to take that into account. Otherwise, you make very bad decisions. And that's what I'm talking about here is that the U.S. has been making bad decisions and is continuing to do so. And it's putting everybody in peril, Ukrainians, Russians, the world. I mean, uh, I just think that we have to um, have to get some sense. I mean, that's why it's very important to read uh, not only the sites that Marianne is pointing out, but there are some news aggregators in English and so on that try and talk about the press in other parts of the world. That's so important because we get such a skewed sort of view when we talk about the international community. Usually we're talking about the G7. You know, we're talking about the wealthiest right. economies, but a small part of the world. And we say, well, the international community has decided, you know, there are 180 countries, 190 countries in the UN. And there are also, you know, BRICS and many, you know, important uh, economies. Um, they have a say too. India and China, these two countries are you know, three billion people and emerging as massive powers, they, you know, they don't want to be pressed into the U.S. kind of rules based order. Um, you know, all these sanctions we just did for guerrilla history, a recording on sanctions against China. And there's something interesting about the uh, Switzerland case that, Anne, you know, Anne was mentioning Um the world, you know, kind of production system is so integrated that there are anything really complex is going to have components from all over. Very few things are sourced 
and produced in one country. And so what it means is that, you know, trade, when the U.S. imposes these sanctions um, and says that no U.S. business you know, can provide components for, you know, uh, something happening in Iran, for example, et cetera, it really puts a stranglehold on a, you know, enormous network of companies trying to, you know, make things, sell things and so on. Um, in just the same way that Switzerland makes a component for the, you know, German military and can exercise some kind of leverage over the supply uh, chain and production. This is how the U.S. sanctions work on China. They're using the fact that there are Chinese companies that do business with Iran as a basis for sanctioning those those companies, like the whole Huawei case that happened where the U.S. asked uh, Canada to, you know, arrest this, you know, uh, Chinese Huawei executive who was visiting in Canada and created a huge storm uh, diplomatically uh, and you know, where Canada felt rather exposed having to take the brunt of ire diplomatically and geopolitically from China because of this act that they'd been pushed to do on behalf of the U.S. because the U.S. claimed Huawei was doing business with Iran, was selling phones or doing something, you know, in in Iran. Um, This is not a way to manage a global economy unless, unless military Keynesianism is the only advantage and the only real structure that you have. And so that's that's what we're seeing is that this dysfunction that creates chaos, disorder, disruption around the world is a sacrifice of the rest of the world for the sake of a very few around whom you know, who's who have captured our government and who are receiving the principal benefit of the largesse of U.S. military spending for its, you know, kind of imperial designs, uh, you know, in the world. This is not a recipe for a sustainable planet, for a sustainable world. Um, we've got to be working against it. Uh, great. OK, well, let, let's end on something cheerful. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a fascinating conversation. Something upbeat, Ron DeSantis, uh, and his uh, he's helping academia. He's tackling yes. some problems in in Florida's uh, state schools. Uh, professor Ann Lee, give us something cheerful. I know that Professor Marianne Cummings was telling the I said the whole the ozone is filling in, and and so Ron DeSantis is doing the Lord's work for academia. <laughs> oh, and. It- Indeed, he is, David. Uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, because he likes putting cronies in place or at least uh, punishing those who resist him in Florida. And he has a little bit of control as governor over appointing uh, regents or um, uh, members of boards of trustees. He decided to make uh, Christopher F. Rufo the one of the key figures in the entire discourse of attacks on critical race theory, on attacks on LGBTQ uh, uh, discourse and disciplines in education. Um, He made Christopher F. Rufo a member of the Board of Trustees of New College of Florida, which uh, is technically a division of the state university and uh but it's a uh, special school why is it why is it a special school it was many decades ago one of the initiators of more flexible and experimental curricula and as a small college uh there was an experimental small college movement that had places like evergreen state and a variety of other places that uh um uh, are were sort of collected during a period of, of more interesting and I think more evocative times in education. On the other hand, it's hippie bashing. Uh, but anyway, the mm-hmm. um, uh, by placing him in that particular, it was a political appointment, clearly, and it is a sign that he wants to control more elements of both the K-12 and the higher education system in Florida. Uh, it's all just quite exciting. He wants, in that sense. He wants co- 
people who go to college to get the same education that somebody who's homeschooled has gotten. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it is not fair that people the, people who get homeschooled, it's not fair that they get such a great education homeschooled. It's just and, going and, it, and it and it is significant that, you know, it's a college that sits right next to uh uh, we all remember uh, P.T. Barnum and uh, Ringling Brothers. It's next to the Ringling Museum. So it 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 does have a certain circus like aspect to it, which is sort and of the, the way. And the Clown College. <laughs> there is no. a Clown College there. <laughs> there. Yeah. Yes, I think there is a Clown College. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that's are very appropriate for um, mm -hmm. uh, Governor DeSantis. So I know people. Yes, who went I, to the it's up big. So go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. Carry on. Uh, no, no. So uh, Ru Rufa wants to change it. Well, Rufo's not the provost or dean, but you can see that he will have an, a chilling effect, I think, on curriculum and activity. And, you know, you'll see people being positioned there as visiting professors, et cetera. Uh, these this is a an experience that we've seen at other schools in Florida, like with the Koch brothers contributing money to the University of Florida's at Florida State. I can never remember which one. Um, and, you know, intervening in, in, in a variety of things. Uh, I, it's no different than that. A sort of a rightward, rightward shift. And of course, uh, there's a, a recent article where uh, one of the few people who actually taught a uh, uh an upper division, I think actually a, a graduate level course in a critical race theory will not teach it. Uh, he's a black professor and will not teach it because he knows that this is uh, this would endanger his ability to get tenure. Uh, wow. It's it, there is, in fact, a chilling effect across academia in that context. Hmm. And they're the party of the First Amendment. Right? Oh, indeed. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Professor Ann Lee. Read her every night over at the Daily Co's. Her handle is Annie Lee. Thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings, particle physicist, Fermi Lab, Parks Commissioner, Aurora, Illinois. Thank you, Professor Jonathan Bick. We'll see you Friday night at office hours for the Twilight Zone and then Saturday for Star Trek. We have a six- PM start for office hours to accommodate the Europeans. You see, they wow. say they say Americans don't bend. Well, we're we've after a couple of years, we've heard the call and we're doing an earlier start now for office hours. But we're still resisting the metric system, David. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that's our exceptionalism. And uh, Professor Adnan Hussein hosts two podcasts, the Mudgeless podcast and uh, Guerrilla History. Who's on the Mudgeless podcast? Um, uh, former MA student um, who's working on um, labor in the Middle East. We'll be talking about the Kafala system. Right. That episode should come out very soon. The right. uh, kind of labor... Uh, regime that operates in the Gulf and other parts of the Middle East. Uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about that. And on guerrilla history, a really great episode. I, I strongly recommend the guest, a uh, fascinating person, Jason Moore. And the topic is world ecology and the capitalocene. We've heard of the Anthropocene that is human intervention you know, uh, you know, through our various activities, uh, human intervention in uh, climate uh, change. And um, he's put forward a different concept and a different dating of all of this that he calls the Capitalocene that, uh, you know, coordinates it much more closely with the rise of forms capitalism. of industrial capitalism. Amazing. Um, so that's it's a great episode, Jason Moore. I really recommend it for people. Fantastic. Thank you all. It's a privilege to to hear you talk and to listen to you and it's fantastic. Let's go to Norway, Joe. What what did you make? The middle dish looks very healthy, but it looks thick and it fills your, it looks like it could 
It's, it looks like comfort food to me. What is that? Very com- This is like Korean macaroni and cheese, minus the gluten and minus the cheese. <laughs> so it's a, it's a rice noodle, basically, cooked in a chili stock that reduces after you cook it a while, the, the, the starch and the, the rice noodles, which I made out of uh, a bunch of rice papers that I had lying around, mm-hmm. will thicken itself. And then I just add some scallion, coriander or cilantro and uh, black and, and white sesame seeds. And I think the presentation gets an A+. Plus. That looks like something you would see in a Martha Stewart magazine. Okay, what is that? Uh, this one is a uh, blanched uh, mung bean salad with um, uh, kind of kombu vinaigrette and some chilies as well. So they got salty, sweet, and sour. And the babies, tell me about your babies. Yeah. Yes, these are uh, these are garlic blanched, quickly blanched baby asparagus tossed in take, a so similar took, kind of. Dress. You took the babies and you put them in boiling water, and they are after one minute. Toss them in ice water bath, and then they maintain their crunch and color. This is a, a, a garlic uh, baby asparagus salad, but the uh, the garlic's hanging out over here because I yeah. accidentally forgot to add it in there. I also blanched some some um, Roman uh, Romana salad, salad that I had lying around as well. So. Wow! I'm looking at <laughs> professors Bick and Marianne, and we're just like, wow! <laughs> deep. Okay. We've got breakfast. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all. So I- I just wanted to point out on uh, office hours, we've, we've got, in addition to Adnan and you know, Professor John, Falco will be uh, giving a talk on uh, Lutzroth and direct action against coal mining in Germany at 11 o'clock. And then we still have some openings at, uh, let's see, 7, uh, 8, or one, uh, 12 o'clock and 1 a.m. And then uh, early in the morning, I'll be falling down skiing if anybody wants to go uh, cross-country skiing with me. A lot of us will be falling down drunk. So, And a number of film viewings as well, documentaries. Perfect. Thank you all. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump.